thanks for having me. Um, I'm excited to share some bad news for plants, uh, unfortunately. Um, is everyone here a master gardener? Mostly? Yeah, okay, great. Um, thank you. So my, my plan, my goal is to talk about emerald ash borer and spotted lanternfly as two really critical um, insect pest problems that we have in our tree resource. Um, so I want to talk quickly about what it is, why it's important, how to recognize it, and what can be done about it, and then some, some suggested advice for you to give when you might uh, receive calls about these two insects or the, or the host plants that they, uh, they infest. So we'll spot with, or start with emerald ash borer. So how many of you are at least somewhat familiar with emerald ash borer? Right, it's been around for a long time. So, uh, so most people have heard about it. So really quickly, we have the adult. Um, it's a, it's a wood-boring beetle, exotic invasive, uh, native to Asia. The, uh, the actual beetle is much, much smaller than that. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I have some samples with me up here, so I'm hopeful that at lunchtime, everyone will stop by and take a look to see the actual size of both of these insects to get a better idea of what they look like and what you might see. It is the larval phase of the insect that's up in the top corner there that does the damage. The larvae feed on the cambium of ash trees, all, all species of true ash. So the genus Fraxinus uh, is what's affected by this insect. And the larvae tunnel these kind of S-shaped galleries through the cambium layer. The cambium is the living layer of cells within the trees. It's the live part just underneath the bark. So as the larva feeds on the cambium layer of the trees, um, it cuts off the tree's ability to move water from the roots up into the leaves, and then the sugar is produced in photosynthesis back down to the rest of the tree, essentially girdling the tree and killing it. So that's what's happening with emerald ash borer. It's important because it has killed hundreds of millions of trees in the United States. It was originally found in the United States, in Michigan in 2002. It was first confirmed in New Jersey in 2014. And it's tricky because at first your trees will seem fine. For many years, ash trees can look fine and be building up populations of emerald ash borer larvae underneath the bark. And, oh, okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, so your ash trees can seem fine for, for years and then all of a sudden be too far affected to be treated. So it's really important to address this insect early on, even before the tree is showing any symptoms of being infected. They'll seem fine and then they'll be dead and it goes as quick as that. And so this picture is from Ohio where uh, you have a, this line of beautiful, you know, and a lay of ash trees that is perfectly healthy in the summer of 2006 and then by the summer of 2009 every one of them is stone dead. So it really does happen very quickly. So the research tells us all of the, the folks from the Midwest who've been dealing with this since 2002 tell us that in the landscape over 99 percent of untreated ash trees will die. So Waiting to see whether or not your ash tree is going to get emerald ash borer and die is really not the best tactic. You should assume that it either has or very soon will have emerald ash borer. And if it's in good shape and it's a good healthy tree and you want to keep it, the time to start treating is now, if not before now already. The other thing about this that makes it really an important and dangerous problem is that ash trees dry out very quickly when they die, and even more so with an infestation with emerald ash borer, something about the way that the emerald ash borer kills the tree, makes it dry out very, very quickly. And then the trees are undergoing these massive structural failures. They just fall apart in really unpredictable ways. And that makes it really dangerous to have in your yard or to park under, and makes it really dangerous for the, the tree workers who you would bring in to, to cut them down. So it becomes very dangerous and much more expensive to have the trees removed 
after they're dead. So to being proactive with emerald ash borer is really very important. And it's very important to know that a non-professional should not attempt to take down a tree ever, really, but even more so, you, you can't get your handyman to cut down your ash tree that's dead from emerald ash borer. It's very, very dangerous. So emerald ash borer has been confirmed in 88. Oh, sorry about that, municipalities. <laughs> So 88 municipalities have been confirmed with emerald ash borer, spanning 14 counties. And then this is a map that you can find on the New Jersey Department of Agriculture website on their EAB page. And when you look at it, I don't know if you can see it uh, from here, but you might notice that the numbers of municipalities where we were confirming them go up until 2017 and then they start going down again. And I just want to point out that that does not mean that this is getting better. That means we stopped looking for it. And, and efforts were diverted from survey to treatment and management and outreach. So we're actually kind of hitting the crest, I think, of this problem. And things are, are actually, at this point, getting worse in New Jersey for emerald ash borer. So I just wanted to point that out so you understand what you're seeing. And, and just because a municipality or county has not been colored in as you know, confirmed for emerald ash borer certainly does not mean that it isn't there. It just means that it hasn't been reported and confirmed by the Department of Agriculture. So for most of New Jersey, you can assume that your ash tree either has or will soon have emerald ash borer. Tricky thing is that a lot of other things will attack ash trees. It has other, other borers, native borers that attack it. It's got other disease issues. And an ash tree can have all of those things all at the same time. So this is a really tricky one. How do you recognize it? You're very unlikely to see the actual emerald ash borer. It's very small. The larvae are behind the bark. Um, if you ever are going to see the adult, it would be around this time of year. We're right at about the peak for adult emergence from the trees right now. But you are far more likely to see um, these other symptoms and signs from the tree. And er, woodpecker activity is a really great early warning sign <laughs> that you've got an emerald ash borer problem. So the woodpeckers, you have the, the typical woodpecker holes, but then they've also kind of learned a new behavior where they go from the side of the, of the furrows in the bark and just fleck the bark off from the side. So when you're reading about it or searching online, it's usually called flecking or blonding. And you may have seen in some ash trees where it looks really light in color because the bark has been, has been just flecked off by woodpeckers that are looking to, to feed on the larva. So the woodpecker activity is a really good indication that you have an infestation of emerald ash borer. And you're much more likely to see that than to see the actual insect. You may also see a lot of epicormic sprouting. Um, happening in your tree. Emerald ash borer likes to start from the top of the tree generally and then work its way down. And, and as I mentioned, the, uh, the larvae are feeding their way through the cambium. That's cutting off the flow of water and nutrients. So the tree starts to die from the top down and then it flushes a bunch of growth closer to the bottom of the stem just to try to uh, put some growth out there that it can use to photosynthesize and stay alive. So those um, kind of reflexes that the tree is putting out are another good indicator that you might have emerald ash borer acting on that tree. And once you get to this, this stage, you're, you're maybe really too late to, to treat it, and now we're talking removal. So what can you do about it? The treatments, chemical insecticide treatments, are actually very, very effective if they are repeated. There's the one, um, one chemical that you do as a systemic injection, a trunk injection, every other year. If population pressure of emerald ash borer gets lower, some of the research is saying that you could even stretch it out to every three years. All of the other ones, there's, you can do a soil injection or, or soil drench. You can do trunk injections. And there's a basal bark spray that if you start before the tree is showing symptoms are also really effective as a preventive measure. The timing of treatment is really important. It's also really important to start while your tree looks healthy. There's a website, emeraldashboard.nj.gov. This is on the Department of Agriculture site. 
that has a lot of great information on this. So if you are getting calls and getting questions about you know, potential emerald ash borer problems, this is a great place to direct people. There's an EAB action kit that was put together by the New Jersey Forest Service that has a lot of great tools for municipalities, like sample press releases and posters and all that kind of thing where you can put in the name of your own municipality. There's also this management options uh, booklet that goes through all of the different chemical treatments and the research that was done on them and which ones are best under which conditions. So that's a really great resource. This is also, if you scroll down a little, that's where the map is that's um, continually updated as new locations are found in the state. When, when talking to someone who is looking to find a contractor to either you know, treat or remove an ash tree, um, the recommendation I think should be to contact a licensed tree expert or licensed tree care operator. We have a new law in New Jersey that in order to uh, sell tree care services you must be registered and licensed with the state. So you can just search New Jersey Board of Tree Experts or New Jersey Licensed Tree Experts and find that directory. So you can send people to that. Uh, but also, not everyone who is a licensed tree expert or licensed tree care operator has experience with emerald ash borer treatments or removals. So it's really important to ask questions of whatever uh, professional you're looking to hire to do either treatments or removals. Make sure you find a company that is familiar with emerald ash borer and has done treatments or removals of, of this problem before. Get at least three quotes. Uh, make sure you know you see an insurance certificate and all that kind of thing I think is really good advice for you to give. Just to reiterate, this is tricky because the, the, if you're treating your tree, the evidence that it's working is that nothing is happening. So that's always a tough sell, right? And it's also kind of a tough sell when like when your trees look great, like in that top pic picture, they're very easy to treat. Like the treatment is going to be really effective. But it's going to be kind of difficult to convince someone to spend the money to start doing chemical treatments on that tree when they're, from appearance, there's nothing wrong with it, right? But then it can be as early as the very next year. You know, you come back in the spring and it's too late. And then you easy to convince somebody that there's something wrong with that tree, but it may be too late to do anything about it other than hurry up and try to get it down before it collapses. So that's, that's kind of the rub with this one. It's tricky. This is a tree that I saw, you know, uh, local to me just about a week ago, and I couldn't find any exit holes. I couldn't find any actual insect activity. I couldn't really even find any woodpecker activity, but that tree just looks like it's got emerald ash borer. You know what I mean? It's thinning at the top. It's got this like flush of, of sprouting sort of in the mid part of the tree. And my prediction is that next year that tree will be uh, beyond help. So just have those conversations with people. And then for yourself, start looking at the ash trees and uh, <coughs> calibrating, I guess. But this is an important problem. <laughs> But you can still treat your healthy ash trees. So do it before it's too late. It's, it's, it's dangerous to leave them. It's a shame to lose all the environmental services benefits that, those, that your healthy, mature ash trees are providing. There's something like 26 species of moths that only feed on ash trees. It's an important species. So take all that into consideration. And again, just to reiterate, it is very dangerous to remove ash trees that are dead or that are infested with emerald ash borer. It's very dangerous for the tree worker. The tree can't be climbed. You're going to have to bring in, or the, the contractor will have to bring in equipment like a crane to piece the tree down because they can't send a person into that tree. So the sooner you start, the better off all around. So that's, oh, sorry. How did they dispose of those trees when they're taken out? So, so the, the emerald, ash, the question was how do they dispose of the trees? It's not like, do you remember Asian longhorn beetle where everything had to be double chipped and then put in an incinerator? It's just not like that in this case. This is not an eradication effort. This is not an eradication effort with emerald ash borer. It's throughout New Jersey. It's in 35 states. So... <coughs> 
it's not so much that we're, we're, we're trying to manage it more than eradicate it, right? So there's no reason not to use it as wood chips or firewood. It's still never a good idea to move firewood around because you can just spread an infestation more quickly that way. But if you try to keep the wood locally, there's no reason not to use it. Yes? Does it have any idea how long the infestation will be a threat and how long you need to continue the systemic treatment? So unfortunately, no. They don't know. And, and you know, the, the Midwest, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, that have had it since the very early years, you know, 2002, have been doing research to see if they could back off of the treatments and not yet. So, so from 2002 to now, still not yet. So I don't think we know that. Can I, I'm going to move on and then do questions at the end because I have a very short timeline. Is that okay? <laughs> All right, sorry. Because you definitely want to hear about spotted lanternfly. Isn't it pretty? <laughs> it's awful. So, so spotted lanternfly is, it's not a fly, it's actually a leaf hopper. So, so it feeds by uh, sucking, piercing mouth parts that it inserts into the stems of plants and then sucks out the sap. And both the, the nymphs and the adult feed in the same way. So the adult is very showy. It has the, that bright red uh, you know, hind wing and the, and the yellow kind of bands on the body. But it doesn't really like hang out that way. You're going to see it folded up. So, so it's important to uh, train yourself to recognize it either way. Oh, spotted lanternfly. So why is this important? Spotted lanternfly is a really important problem because it feeds on so many different plants, like from herbs to cucumbers to apple trees to your shade trees. 70 plus species of plants that are, that are host to the, the nymph stages and adult stages of spotted lanternfly. So from an agricultural perspective, the fruit, fruits and fruit trees are, are important, are the important consideration. The, this insect seems to really like table and wine grapes and hops. As, as favorites to feed on. So the, the wine and beer industry is really, really worried about this, as should be wine and beer enthusiasts. <laughs> so, so there's that. And, and I think I just talked about this. They, um, they feed on the, the sap, the phloem. In the, in the tree, so they have those piercing, sucking mouth parts. They kind of stick into the, the stems like a straw, and then they suck out the sap. And they do that so efficiently and so quickly that they produce a great deal of waste from that. And so that's a very sticky liquid that's called honeydew. Are you familiar? OK, so they exude large quantities of honeydew. And, and that gets all over everything. So, so for the first part of it, that feeding, just taking the sap, you know, the, the phloem out of the tree can stunt the plant growth because the insect is stealing the plant's food. The other part of it is that honeydew. There's so much of it that it drips down the stems and gets all over the plant and it creates a great uh, medium to grow sooty mold. So for, for trees and vegetative parts of the plant, that mold can actually grow so thick on the honeydew that's on the leaves that it can block out the sun and prevent photosynthesis. On the fruits, the honeydew with the mold growing on it makes the fruit unusable, unsaleable, right? So it's not that the spotted lanternfly is actually eating the grapes or the apples or the cherries. It's all that honeydew that gets on it that grows mold on the fruit that is the problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, and it also sometimes it could drip down the tree so much that it builds these fungal mats at the bases of the trees, and that, that's not good for them either. And then the other part of it is it's just gross, right? So even if you're not 
a beer or wine enthusiast, or if you don't grow any crops, but this is your backyard, nobody wants that, right? So, so it, this is really a concern for everyone because it feeds on so many different species. And even if it's not going to affect your livelihood, it can affect your quality of life. So how are we going to recognize it? This, uh, the life cycle is one generation per year. This insect, you are likely to see the insect. And you can see all of the different life stages of the insect. This one isn't hiding on the tree. It's just right out there. So we had the, the first instar nymph hatching beginning in April. We're going to have, right now, we're looking at these first through third instar of the nymph, which is the little black uh, with white spots. Soon we can start to see the fourth instar and even the adults start to emerge. Then they lay their eggs in the fall and this insect overwinters in the egg, in the egg masses. So to recognize the adults, they're about an inch in length. Again, I have samples up here. I have a, a vial of them. So I would encourage you at the lunch break to, to stop by and please take a look so you can kind of get a feel for the size and what they look like. And you're generally going to see them folded up. So not quite as showy, but still, I think, very distinctive. Uh, they lay their eggs in the fall. And then again, they overwinter. The insect in overwinters in, in the egg mass. And unfortunately, the egg mass is very, very difficult to see. And they will lay their eggs on any flat surface. So they could be on anything, almost literally anything. And you see they, they cover the egg mass with uh, the substance that kind of just looks like mud. So making it really blend in to, to the environment. And you know that's a, a waxy coating for their protection, but it also makes them really difficult to find. And again, they're laid on any flat surface, and that makes them really easy to transport around. Like they apparently love like a rusty wheel well in your truck or garden trailer. It can be on you know your your folding lawn chairs that maybe you keep at your house, but then bring down to the shore for a weekend in the summer, and then you know, you've moved spotted lanternfly. They could be on you know, your boat trailer, or your boat, or you know, underneath the, on the undercarriage of your car. So it's a really great hitchhiker. So the egg masses contain 30 to 50 eggs, and females can lay up to three egg masses in a year. An egg mass is approximately an inch in size. I have this really cool um, little spotted lanternfly card that has information and pictures, and then it's also a, a egg mass scraper tool. <laughs> so, so at the end, please come down and get one and do your part. If you see an egg mass, scrape it off, and there's instructions for how to destroy the, destroy the eggs. So then you have the nymphs, and this again is what, what we would see now this time of year if you should encounter this. There are um, four instar stages of the nymphs. The first three are kind of shiny black with those white spots. They get progressively larger through the season. The fourth instar has the red wing pads, the color changes, and they get a little bit larger. And then, and then you have the adults. And these guys uh, feed on a lot more species of plants than the adults. Um, the adults kind of, kind of settle into a, a smaller palette, but this is where you're doing your really widespread damage. So I think I, oh, they hop to avoid, they're leaf hoppers, right? They're not flies, they're leaf hoppers. So they're really actually quite difficult to catch if you should try to catch them because they'll kind of wait for you to get close enough to be distracted and then they can jump very, very far. But they feed in the same way as the adults and produce uh, the excessive amounts of honeydew in the same way as adult. So they're all causing the same type of problem. So what can be done? What can we do about this? So, so the step that the Department of Agriculture has taken is to quarantine off the counties that have active populations of spotted lanternfly, or at least that, that they know of, and some counties that are kind of in between those. 
So Pennsylvania has 14 counties that are under quarantine, and New Jersey now has eight as of just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the, the quarantine was expanded. Last year it was Warren, Hunterdon, and Mercer counties, and now it also includes Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, and Salem, so all along the border with Pennsylvania, and then into Somerset. So knowing about the quarantine and what that means for for you and for any of your callers that might live in those quarantined counties can be really helpful. So the quarantine limits movement of any anything. They're just using the word articles because this insect is such a great hitchhiker and will lay those egg masses on just about anything. The quarantine limits movement of things by any means from, from quarantine areas out into non-quarantine areas. The new quarantine was just recently uh, enacted just a couple of weeks ago. So on the Department of Agriculture website, they have a link. I don't know how well you can read it, but it says spotted lanternfly quarantine. Mm -hmm. So the new rules are kind of still, well, they're still up for public comment. So if you're interested, and, and feel like you might want to read those and provide comment, that is available on the, the, the rules section of the Department of Agriculture website. And the public comment period is open for probably another 40 days or so. So take advantage of that if you're so inclined. Department of Agriculture also has a spotted lanternfly page much like the Emerald Ash Borer page, but dedicated to Spotted Lanternfly. So there's a lot of great information there that you can check out for yourself or direct people to. Lots of links to other things. If, um, if you, for your work, move articles into and out of the quarantine, it's recommended, requested that you get, or it may be required, that you get a permit a spotted lanternfly permit to do that. So New Jersey is using the same permitting process as Pennsylvania. They have a training program and then a test that you take online and then you pass that test. They'll send you a little hang tag for your car and a certificate, not a certificate, it's like a letter um, that you are now a, a permitted person to move in and out of the spotted lanternfly quarantine. And that just helps to you know, make you very aware that you should be checking your car and your person and whatever stuff you're moving every time you exit and enter the quarantine area. So what was the quarantine area? Oh, this one, right? So how many of you came from one of these counties? How many of you checked your vehicle carefully for any signs of the spotted lanternfly? <laughs> what have we done? So I mean, it's a lot to think about, and it's, but we need to start thinking about it, is the point. So all of these things are to get people to start thinking about this, because this is still an active eradication effort. This is not management effort like the Emerald Ash Borer. We're still actually trying to eradicate the spotted lanternfly. So please take this seriously. Um, you know, there's a checklist for things to, to think about when you're checking all of the things you're moving. There's links to all the, that permitting process. Lots of handouts that you can print. Control. Um, there's lots of stuff that'll kill spotted lanternfly, but there's so much spotted lanternfly that you, know, you kill them all one day, and then you come back, and there's just a huge population there again. So the tactic that the Department of Agriculture is using is to control it by the host tree, uh, Atlantis, the tree of heaven. It is believed at this time that the Spotted lanternfly needs to feed on Alanthus to complete its life cycle. It likes to congregate on them um, in the fall around their, their mating and egg laying season. So the control, as they're doing it now, to the best of everyone's knowledge at this time, is through the Alanthus tree. So small Alanthus trees are being either removed or, or killed with herbicide. Larger ones, some are being removed. Others are left as trap trees that are treated with an insecticide. The idea being that with fewer Alanthus out there, the trap trees will draw in the spotted lanternfly. Those trees are treated with insecticide to kill 
the spotted lanternfly. It seems to be very effective, and that is what the Department of Agriculture is doing at this time. So what should you do and what advice can you give? So if you see an egg mass or if you see any life stage, they want you to report it to the Department of Agriculture. As I said, this is an eradication effort, so they want to know about every single one that you find. So if you can collect a specimen, that's great. If you can take a picture, that's great too. Just enable the, you know, the GPS coordinates on there or take really good notes about where you are. But then they also want you to kill the individual, right? Or destroy the egg mass. So don't just take a picture and report it, but also kill what you find. So don't, <laughs> just, just do it. And then there's a, there's a website to submit pictures. There's a hotline to call, and that's bad bug zero. Not O, not bad bug O, it's bad bug zero. Leaving a detailed message. The other thing, I called the Department of Agriculture in preparation for this and asked, like, what's the message? What's the, you know, the take home for people who might call the master gardeners? And he said the most important thing is that if you are approached by the survey crews and the treatment crews that are out there from the New Jersey Department of Agriculture or for, from the USDA Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, service the APHIS folks that are, that are working with the New Jersey Department of Ag doing survey and treatments in New Jersey, if approached by them for access to your property to do the survey, or if they find spotted lanternfly or Atlantis on your property to do the treatments, just grant access. Just work with the Department of Agriculture and allow them access onto your property so that they can do this important work to try to eradicate this, this insect. And then you see it, you report it, and you kill it. And uh, a thank you to Paul Kurtz from the Department of Agriculture who shares a lot of his slides and information with me. And you have any questions? I know it's lunchtime, so I don't want to cut into lunch. I'm already four minutes over. But I will be here. I have, I have samples, and I have these cards to give you. So please, please stop by at some point over lunch to, uh, to pick up some stuff. <laughs>